So we're here to talk about whether there should be age limits, age restrictions for children on social media. And this is a big topic going around because of all of the studies that, that pretty much have shown how social media can be harmful to minors who are in the process of de developing their brains. And too much reliance on social media can lead to things like bullying, shaming, uh, un unrealistic expectations, and so forth. And so that's what the panel is going to talk about. We've got a lot of experts and Jim here with us uh, to talk about this. So I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. My name is Dwayne Gatesell. I'm an intellectual property lawyer from Austin, Texas. And we'll just go down the line. Haley? Hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I am Associate Director of Legal Activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there's an EFF table downstairs, and if you'd like to join us, please go seek us out. <laughs> I am Jim Nettles, and the answer is probably yes to, to whatever I'm doing at the time. I write science fiction, urban fantasy, bit of horror, this, that, and the other. I write a lot of nonfiction in terms of business, entrepreneurship, data, privacy, uh, privacy data security, a whole lot of different stuff in that space. Um, I do a lot of business and technology consulting work. I do a lot of stuff in... Uh, generative AI work. I do a lot of stuff in fintech. I do a lot of other things, some of which I can't actually even talk about, but some of which may actually come up here while we're here, so don't tell anyone. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I started my 1 p.m. panel yesterday saying good morning because it felt like morning, but I will appropriately say good afternoon at 1 p.m. today. Um, I appreciate you all being here. My name is Amy Stepanovich. I am currently the Vice President for U.S. Policy at the Future Privacy Forum, um, where we work on issues that intersect with privacy from AI to mobility and location tracking um, through health and wellness issues. And notably, for this panel in particular, have a very large team that works on um, privacy issues for folks um, related to youth and education, so children and in education spaces. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and I was kidding about Jim because I've known him for years and he's a jack of all trades, as you can tell. Um, whereas I only know one or two things, Jim knows far too many for any one person's good. So Or my own. <laughs> so let's talk about you know, what's going on out there in the world. For example, Utah just recently passed a law that in essence says for children to get on social media, you have to have parental consent. There's uh, no allowed use between 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. Um, everyone has to basically go through the age gating procedure and so forth um, in order to be verification. There's not supposed to be any targeted ads or data collected from children. Now, whether the Utah law, law withstands constitutional analysis is a different thing, but I'm wondering if that might be a preview of what's to come. Haley, what do you think? Yeah, so um, so in my job, I work uh, often at, at the state level. Um, I work in state legislatures, and we've certainly seen an uptick of, um, of bills coming at all of these, you know, all of these angles, and um, in, as in Utah's case, kind of all of them at once. Um, I think there is a lot of concern out there um, from parent groups especially, um, and legislators are picking up on that. So I certainly think we're going to see a lot more of these before we see fewer. All right. Um, Jim, let me ask you, just as a preliminary issue, the issue, I guess, of age gating. Can you explain what age gating is? From a technological perspective, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges with, with looking and understanding how, what the age is of a user, right? because fundamentally we are relying on honesty. How many of us here believe that teenagers are honest? Whether they intend to be or not. Anyway, so from an age gating standpoint, from a technological standpoint, we really have minimal controls about who can and can't sign up, you know, putting in real data, things along these lines. So the idea of age gating really relies on people saying, yes, I am this person at this age, and for systemic controls to be able to control and moderate what kind of content somebody can see. You know, for example, Facebook, I think it's still 13 years old. You have to be at least 13 to sign up. Um, but I've known plenty of kids whose parents or the kids themselves went and signed up and said, yeah, I'm now 17 years old and signed up as a kid. Um, so age gating fundamentally is trying to balance the level of technology and what technology can do to help moderate content, moderate what people are exposed to, and the other side of that being 
what can the technology do to know who you exactly are? And so there's a lot of other challenges, but that's a very kind of microcosm way of looking at it. Every time I've signed up for one of those things that asks the age, miraculously, I'm 25 years younger. I, I don't know how. I don't know how that happens. Which makes him three. Yeah. And, but there's, there's no checking. There's no verification. Right. It's simply, I'm going to enter, this is my date of birth, and that's what it is, and away it goes. The, the one thing I will say there is that the, that the systemically AIs are able to do more of is look at the pictures, images, things that you're doing, the way it's tagging, because facial recognition is a thing. And over time, the systems will build up and give an, an idea of approximate age. But if you never actually take pictures of yourself, uh, if you're never tagged, thing, if you're using avatars, other things like that to um, shelter who you are, then the systems, again, have very limited controls on what they can and can't determine. Right. And Amy, with respect to, and right now we're just talking about kind of the preliminary issues as things are right now, the parental consent and the age gating, uh, what concerns do you have, just say, from the parental consent side? Um, can, do you mind if I ask the audience a few questions first? Just sure. to get a sense of who's out here. How many of you have a social media account? How many of you have had it more than 10? There are actually a couple people without hands up, I want you all to know. How many of you have had it for more than five years? More than 10 years? More than 15 years? More than 20 years? More than 25 years? Okay, all the hands have finally gone down. I don't um, think any of my BBS accounts are still around at this point from the 80s. I, I'm impressed. But Probably by have a live journal alone. that I should take down Here. somewhere. <laughs> um, how many of you have children with social media accounts? Also, by the way, somebody who says that children or teenagers don't lie, which I appreciate. Um, and then how many, how old were you? Raise your hand if you were in this age range when you first got on social media, um, between zero to 10. 10 to 20? 20 to 30? 30 to 40? 40 and above. Very interesting. Sorry, I was asked a question, but I really wanted to know who is out here and how much um, you were dealing with this particular issue. Um, first of all, I am a very pedantic person, if you know me, and so I will say I don't have any concerns necessarily um, with parental consent, but I do have, I do think it raises risks, and these are different things. A lot of times privacy people are like, oh, you're the hand-wringing people in the corner who have concerns about privacy, and aren't you cute? Um, and I, I really do like to combat that to say, like, I don't necessarily just have, like, superficial concerns. I look at risks, I look at threats, I look at possible harms, and then I want to respond to them. Um, and parental consent in particular raises a good number of risks. Um, I would like to believe, but I will not ask this question, um, optimistically I want to believe, because I believe in goodness sometimes, that all of you in this room were raised in kind, loving, caring households. Um, but that is not the case for a large number of people in this country. Um, they do not have parents who accept them for who they are. Um, they have to hide elements of their personality um, for fear of violence or retribution or being kicked out or not supported. Um, and so parental verification actually ends up giving parents a lot of control over their children and teenagers' lives that prevents them from being able to explore very critical parts of their personalities that the internet has opened up for them to be able to explore. We had a long history where we didn't have that ability. Um, if teenagers and children were not allowed to or not able to express themselves in their small communities, I was raised in a very small and very intolerant community. Um, you didn't have access to certain communities. Um, the internet opened that up. They let people actually express themselves and figure out there are people like me and they might not live here, but they live somewhere. And with parental consent, you're, you're really running a high risk of closing that back down again for a large segment of the population. And so you like to think, and a lot of times we talk about issues of parental consent and age verification in this bubble of children should trust their parents and parents want what is best for the children. And I think the big risk is that we don't recognize that there are serious risks that come with giving parents control over their children to the child themselves. And the Utah law in particular, I actually really believe is going to cost lives at some point when parents find out 
um, that their children have elements of their being, their like their very selves that the parents do not agree with um, and will get violent toward. Other, other than that, any other problems? So can I actually be the counter argument here just to cause trouble? Um, so he, I have a couple of fundamental issues or concerns in terms of the space with children being allowed access to social media without a degree of moderation. First of all, we have to remember that kids are still, their brain development is still at such a point that they do not have regulation of a lot of brain chemistry, neurochemistry, things along these lines. So they have no dopamine regulation. So we look at social media. I mean, I can tell you the number of adults I know. Did it get a like? Did, 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 did I get my hit? Did I? Did? Kids are much, much worse because we've trained kids now. Am I being liked because of that? Which then causes dopamine overloads, which means kids then cannot moderate what they're doing. So without a degree of, of um, main, maintenance and moderation on that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Um, so without something to regulate and have a view of that, it can, and there is a plenty of research that shows this is something that is damaging to kids under a certain age. The second thing is this. We all would like to believe that social media is the place that allows us to express freely who we are, what we do, what we believe, what we want, and we should be able to freely express that. I will tell you at the same time, that is not the world we live in. And this is something where we are watching ages where what things that kid, kids posted under the age of 18 are now being held against them as they look for employment, as they look for education, as they look for other opportunities. And so without a degree of a viewpoint oversight and guidance on how to properly use these tools and what they can and can't share can have lifelong impacts for them personally, professionally, all the way down. So I don't think these, sorry, Dwayne, I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't think these things are at odds with one another. I think right. in regard to your first point, mm -hmm. you can have content moderation that is age appropriate mm -hmm. without requiring parental insights into what the child is doing necessarily. And it's, that I hope we get into that because I think that's a very interesting thing to talk about is how to make sure children are having appropriate experiences for themselves that are, are not necessarily causing them increased danger. Mm -hmm. And on the second point, we have we can look over the world and in countries where they have incentivized digital literacy and education about how to be online and how to receive information and what the internet is, the responses to that has been so positive and misinformation has gone down and responses have been more positive um, the U.S. instead decides to prioritize frequently um, responses to that, like counterterrorism proposals that aren't about educating people how to be online, but about how to teach people how to spot people who are acting badly and report them. We have a very reporting, pro um, mm -hmm. monitoring and surveillance approach to a lot of this. And I think if we got back to doing more digital literacy and talking about what it means or um, promoting policies, what Instagram has done recently and taking off the number of likes mm -hmm. that you can't see how many likes somebody has on their post to remove that validation. Like these are very important conversations to have. I think you can have both sides, it, creating a zero sum game where it's like you can either have appropriate experiences for children or give parents ultimate control is, mm -hmm. um, is a false narrative that I want to, I want to combat a little bit. Yeah. No, and it, if I could jump yeah. in, I think another thing about a lot of these, about a lot of these bills, a lot of these laws is they're so broad, right? They draw extremely broad strokes. They treat all people of a certain age as a monolith. Um, you know, I have four nieces and nephews under the age of five. Um, if I was asked to do something that was in the best interest of all of them, they all have their own personalities. They all have their own maturity levels. I couldn't do that. And that's a very small age range, right? If you're really thinking about all kids under 13, all kids under 17, you know, you cannot have a law that treats a eight-year-old the same as a 17-year-old um, and so that is another thing about a lot of the way that these bills are architected and I think that's a really good point is that the government is not particularly known for surgical precision right uh, every every problem is a hammer to to the government generally so how do you moderate this now I I think it's important for people to realize, if everyone doesn't already, I mean, the conflict is built into our system. 
you know, we talk about freedom and equality. Well, those are competing goals. The more free you are, the less equal you are. The more equal you are, the less free you are. And so you've got this inherent conflict in the system. And when you talk about, okay, should we regulate something like this versus should we, you know, leave it up to the parents, it is in essence this battle between freedom and equality. And how do you decide that and how do you balance that? So when you're dealing with not everyone is the same and not everyone's needs are the same. How do you balance those two, the regulation versus the freedom side of it? And I'll throw that out to whoever would like to answer it. All right, so FPF has a infographic that's really pretty that I have pulled up. You can go to fpf.org and see it um, on different ways to do age verification, and there are many of them. So first of all, I think it's not saying parental consent necessarily as like the be all end all. Do not typically when you're regulating a specific thing that is very specific to like what the response is, you're taking away a lot of options that might be better or more positive for different communities. Um, one is age estimation, which um, Haley mentioned like guess, or no, Jim mentioned guessing the age of people. This comes with positives and negatives. Um, right now, the most common one is having a parent verify that they are the parent and put in a credit card number um, to show that they are of an age over 18, positives and negatives. I talked about some of the negatives. Another one is if you have another adult figure in your life who is over, like it's very easy to fake. So if you're a bad actor, you can fake it. If you're a good actor, it actually can put you in, in greater harm. Um, one of my favorites is actually a system that I think is more privacy protected um, called federated identity um, systems where I choose a company and I give them my identity and I verify my identity with that company, um, ident an identity provider, if you will, and they can be anybody. Um, and that identity provider will then keep my information and only turn over what they need to, to any organization I am interacting with on the internet. So if I want to buy alcohol, that company will just say she is over 21. They don't have to say my address, they don't have to say my birth date, they don't have to say anything else, but she is over 21 and can do this. If they need to know my name for whatever reason, they can just say my name, but not my, you know, not all of the other information you're asked to turn over. So it is a, in an extent, even more privacy protective than it is today, because today, if you want to verify your age, how many of you show a driver's license or passport? Yeah. And, and that has much more information than your age on it. So you're giving over a lot more information today than just like, I can buy this alcohol. Um, the, only, the couple of things I would say is, and yes, I agree that, that I am talking in a, a little bit of extremes, but the reason I'm talking to extremes is if we understand the extreme points, then we can find the place on the sliding scale that makes sense. And there's a couple of other things I think to, to give consideration to is that we're looking at things because I'm making the assumption most everybody in here is from the States or at least North America. If you're European, your view on things is very different. Um, and because we operate in a global world, you know, half the world, three point some odd billion people will have access to the data, be able to see, do what they want to with this with kids. Um, is And a much of my life is about risk mitigation, risk identity, and understanding risk and liability. Um, one of the things I will add here, I do not have kids. I have nieces and nephews. I have worked with a lot of kid development programs. I have a lot of them I've mentored over the years. So none of this is about, oh, yeah, I'm trying to protect my kids. I don't have any. I'll go torment them all day long for my own amusement value. But looking at that, I also look at how do we protect kids from a variety of risks. I look at these platforms as pre pre presenting great opportunity, great ability to connect, great ability to relate. I also look at the bad actors that are out there and I have to make the assumption that there are enough bad actors that present viable risks in a lot of different ways. And so again, this goes back to balancing parental guidance and parental obligation, because that's one of the things I don't want to lose here either, is parents have an obligation to the health and welfare of their kids. The problem is we have a bunch of people that disagree on what does that mean and how they you know, treat their kids and understand who their kids are, right? And belief systems come into conflict. We have to balance that 
against the ideas of how kids develop and at different paces, different rates. To your point, not every child is the same and we try to treat and we have to sort of work in terms of a median point, the masses, and hope for the best. And so this is one of those places where we're at is hope for the best and honestly we work in a herd mentality. There will be losses along the way. That is unfortunate and we move on. And I know that is a very harsh way to look at that, but that is also one of the considerations we have to take from a risk management standpoint. One of the points that I wanted to make is you know, when I have two girls and when they were young, our rule was you were allowed 30 minutes of screen time per day, pick whatever screen, whether that's TV or phone or whatever, and it was only 30 minutes and then you had to put it aside. And then as they get older and hopefully a little more responsible and so forth, uh, you know, that, that could increase until now when they can do whatever they want, but that's a different issue. So the question that I have is to what extent should we even have the government involved in this versus more of what Amy was talking about, do the education early, have you know, some kind of understand, not understanding, but that the onus of this is more on the parents to enforce the, the time limits or the platforms or whatever and leave the government out of it entirely. Is that a good or bad idea? Haley, what do you think? I mean, you know, for me, I think I struggle a lot with these bills, right? Because I, I do see that there are problems, I think, in many ways, the social media regulation bills are focusing on the wrong end of the problem, right? There are a lot of harms on social media that you can address in other ways without necessarily kind of clear cutting and doing a, a across the board policy. I think, you know, for example, with age verification, I'm concerned about if you're trying to verify the ages of a couple people on your site, you have to get information from everybody who visits your site. So it, it increases data collection. Um, I. I have not seen a solution that I, in legislation that I think is appropriate, that balances all of these things well and doesn't cause other harms that, you know, that can outweigh mm -hmm. the, the issue that we're trying to deal with and also addresses the actual issue that we're trying to deal with. Maybe we should talk about that. What's being proposed for this particular problem? So, um, well, does, go ahead. Um, yeah, so age verification certainly, right? So. Um, we've seen, um, uh, sorry, it, you know, in uh, Louisiana and Texas sort of um, proposals to make sure that you verify the age of everyone who, it, uh, who visits certain sites, um, the parental consent, right? Um, we've also seen, uh, even in federal legislation, a proposal to ban all children under 13 from, uh, from joining social media. So, you know, these are big, big proposals that affect a lot of people's lives and honestly, a lot of decisions that a lot of parents are making right now that are um, sensitive to their own children's needs. Right, yeah, it's, <clears throat> again, the lack of surgical precision. It's just, we're gonna go nuclear and, you know, just right. knock everything out. And is it just me or is the, the whole notion of, okay, we have to get all this information to verify that someone is you know, of age, doesn't that in and of itself create the whole lack of privacy problem or hacking and so forth. Oh, I'm going to provide all this information to keep my s children safe, but after I provide all that information, someone can hack into it and now they're no longer safe. Right. Where does okay. it go? How long does it stay there? Right. Where else can it go? Right. Um, I think a lot of the issues, right, even if we think about the current age limit on social media sites, that's because uh, can you collect data for advertising purposes from children under the age of 13? So in a lot of ways, I think if we address data privacy, um, we could address a lot of these issues as well. Yeah, Jim, you mentioned you kind of took the, the counter position a little while ago as far as in moderation. Given all of the studies, should social media be considered an addictive substance like cigarettes and regulated in the same manner that we regulate cigarettes? That is a very challenging question. Because again, one of the things I, and I really have come to believe is that we should be educating kids in school how to understand their reward system in their brain, how their brain rewards them, how their brain punishes them. Um, because the way I, I have seen a lot of mental health issues come up with kids because they didn't understand the reward system and what they began to pursue as kids as to what they, what really fed that whether it was video gaming, whether it was, you know, we, whether it was different things that they read, whether it's different things that they see. 
and I could make an argument. I could I could make a, a, an argument that I would say no one under the age of 21 should be allowed on a social media platform um, and almost treat it like alcohol because there are so many risks around personality, data, making poor decisions, things that get documented and will never go away, things that share data that a lot of the time people don't understand what they've shared and how much you can do with that data um, and making those decisions as a minor and I know I said 21 but again even if you go up to 17 18 years old the decisions you make I mean there there's a young lady that got her dream job as an editor at teen, one of the teen fashion magazines I don't remember which one now Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue. Um, that got an offer of her dream job. And then because of something she posted underage, her career is destroyed. And so something that was done as an offhand remark, thought it was going to be just among friends, <clears throat> then all of a sudden becomes part of your foundational career and it's something that's defining and you're known for. Um, I, and I'm going to go the other direction as well in terms of think about how often we can look at things that we get suckered into you know do I know and recognize the fact that that's a scam if it's something that somebody in their 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s is going to get pulled into if you don't have the life experience to balance that against you don't have the tool set to even contemplate that there's a risk attached to that um, one of the arguments I've made and something I did with a think tank several a number of years ago was we proposed development of segmented areas so that eight kids could be verified of age and only allowed in those areas and that when you hit 18 you would get a one-time option to say delete my history now nothing ever fully goes away right there's a bunch of other challenges and technological issues and stuff but it would at least give that I one shot to scrub your history when you turned 18 um, or at least to have these segmented areas that you could control and have better reasonable controls for safety security things like this to allow people in and because again I also don't believe there's such a thing as a safe space in a, in a social media platform no matter what you do that being said I also believe in personal choice, personal freedom, personal responsibility, and that's one of those things that we're also trying to teach kids at those ages. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ask me, should it be regulated, I have problems with some of the things that we regulate the way they're regulated now. So if I regulate social media because of a dopamine hit, does that also mean I'm going to regulate the idea that the kids love you know, chicken nuggets? They're not the same thing, but I can go down that Sorry, slope. Sorry, I also really love chicken nuggets. <laughs> that one hit home really hard. That wasn't me trying to react. <laughs> Sorry, folks. But you do have the calorie count now on menus right. in some states, right? Yeah. So. And I think, I mean, I think we, you all have raised, you know, important in that vein, right, about sort of calorie counts. And the, right? It's important to have better digital, digital literacy, better education, to make mm -hmm. sure that people have access to that, uh, to that education and information, some of which, in fact, may happen on social media. Right. <laughs> well, the, the different, I think there is a notable difference here between cig the analogy cigarettes and social media, because social media comes down to speech and expression. Mm -hmm. Like, it is not a thing you have access to that is harming your health. It is a means of communicating and expressing yourself of which we, not only as a country, but as a human rights principle, have given great emphasis toward protecting. And so you're limiting the ability for people to communicate um, with one another. And as Haley referenced, if you're limiting it for children, if you're acquiring some sort of verification, that's not only for children, that is for every, everybody has to go and either say, I am a child or I'm not a child. Um, which means you are turning over that information to that company um, and that will limit for everybody. If you want to remove anonymity because you want to know that there are children, that removes anonymity for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that might be okay for you, but for the activist who is working against a government that is going to torture and imprison them for what they are saying, removing anonymity is not the, does not mean the same thing. The risk is very different. 
I want to talk a little bit about the freedom and expression issue because early on, social media, it wasn't called social media. Remember, it was called social networking. And the whole idea was, oh, I'm going to connect with friends and you know people that I've lost track with and so forth. And somewhere around 2008, 2009, social networking became social media. And the implications of those two are very different. One is, oh, this is good. It's for connections and that kind of thing. And media is, I'm the crazy uncle with the bullhorn who's now broadcasting all of my crazy conspiracy theories to the world. It doesn't have to be that, of course, but it certainly enabled that, whereas before it really wasn't. And so my question is, should we be focusing, with respect to the freedom and expression idea, on companies or platforms that are more about the actual expression or you know, connection versus the harmful content, if you will? And I know that gets into the issue of censorship and so forth, mm -hmm. but should there be a dichotomy between the platforms that enable connections versus the ones that allow my crazy uncle to say whatever he wants? I am the crazy uncle, but it's all about books, right? It, here's what I actually would like to see that to me is kind of a middle ground that I think legislation could be passed on. It's still problematic in certain ways, but I actually would like to see that the first time you sign up for an account, you go through a, an online training about privacy, use of the tools, how do you use them, how do you educate yourself, risks, rewards, I'd like to see everybody have to go through a mandatory training when you sign up on the platform. I'd also like, and so part of that would include, hey, by the way, here's the laws about how you do and don't do it. Copyright, IP, how do, what do you share, what do you not? Because we're seeing a lot more liability around these things and around restrictions that the platform's put on. And I could see a periodic, hey, you're using the platform. We're now requiring you also to have this training because your laws have changed. And if some of the changes come with Section 230 that have been proposed, a lot of things along these lines, if liability shifts more and more and more to the users and we don't educate people, there's going to be a lot of people that get in a lot more trouble. And I, I would almost rather see education being mandated before you can use the platform with periodic refreshers than I would necessarily see heavy regulation about what you can and can't do. Amy, thoughts? I'm just because consent fatigue is a real thing. I'm interested mm -hmm. if you all downloaded a new app on your phone and before you could open it, you had a 10 minute training you had to go through. How many of you would delete that app? This and this is the problem with policy is that things that are actually good ideas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't work practically because you're all are like done. Um, I have many things to do in this five minutes of my life, and I'm not going to sit through this. Um, the networking media, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very pedantic. I actually think words and the reason word shift is interesting and important. And I think the reason you talked, we saw the, the shift from networking, social networking to social media is a little bit of what you said, but it's also a little bit of lawmakers pushing for traditional media regulation mm -hmm. on social media. And by calling it social media, they were able to make a case for it to be regulated like media. Um, and so it, it's actually a really wonky, nuanced point um, that led to it being shifted. But we do see this, like, how many of you have heard of drones? Just as a concept. How many of you have heard of UAVs? Eh, actually, more than normal. Um, how many of you have heard of body scanners? How many have heard of AIT machines? Not you, Kurt. <laughs> he works on these issues, too. AIT machines are what the industry tried to call body scanners. Um, the, it's, the acronym is Advanced Imaging Technology because it doesn't sound so scary. Um, UAVs, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, as an acronym, does not sound scary the way drones, drones. sound scary. So they have tried to <clears throat> shift the terminology. Social media and social networking, I think, is another one of those terms that we try to shift because it has consequences for regulation legislation um, beyond just what it means to individuals. So let's talk a little bit. We've talked about what's pending and so forth. Are there any proposals that are out there that actually get to resolving the issues or that you know are better than others or something that might actually tend to address the problem versus making a situation worse 
Media literacy. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with and that. Media literacy. Media liter- literacy. Yeah. And how do you do that? I mean, how many of you ta- took, I took a typing class in mm-hmm. yeah. grade school. Like, how do you put your hand on a keyboard? How do you, I, we got to play um, Oregon Trail a lot. Is that still a thing that people, yeah, is that still around? It's come back. It's come back. Awesome. I love that. You died you of dysentery. You have all died of dysentery. <laughs> um, so we like, we had computer courses because computers were a new thing mm-hmm. and I'm old. Um, I think like we need to be teaching this very young, all the way through grade school, all the way up, how to make sure people, and it's not just um, how to interact with social media, it's, again, how to recognize misinformation, how to process things logic, like logic classes. Um, When you receive an email that is telling you you have somehow won the lottery in a foreign country, and if you just provide us with your social security number, we will send you several million dollars don't respond with the immediate like oh my god i'm gonna be rich and send over your information like take a second think logically um we need to be teaching that very young and all through the process so have a course like in elementary school or something on well, every, to, year. every year every year every year okay all right um in The, the only difference, though, or the only problem here is that if I burn my hand, that eventually heals. Depending on what kind of a digital burn I get. That scar lasts yeah. forever. Let, yeah. let, me, let me throw one thing in here since we're talking about the legislation. This is, there is actually a lot more movement right now around creating insurance and liability products for individuals around cybersecurity and cyber protections. Some of the products they're trying to develop right now, I know because I'm involved in it, involve your online presence and damage that may come because you get sued because of something you post or because of damages that happen because of behavior. And so there's going to potentially be much more monitoring of social media and social activity and what you're actually posting and doing if you're buying these products, right? Because you've got to gauge what the liability and the risk is. Just like if you get a bunch of speeding tickets and going back to your point, if I have to do something to use a platform, this is one of my regular rants, there's no obligation for you to use a given platform. Using a platform is a choice you're making and if you're not paying for that platform, you are the product. Uh, You are probably the product even if you are paying for the platform. (laughs) Yep. No doubt. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, Can we do that later? Yeah, I was going to say questions, but go go right ahead. Um, I am actively in the middle. I have a 12 and a 14 year old. We've been on nonstop computer learning for three years now um, in school. Uh, They actually have a lot of information that they are given on how to how to regulate, um, how to use the computer, how to properly save things. Oh. Sorry. Um, like I said, um, I, have an, I I'm, have a 12 and 14 year old actively in school. We've been on active digital learning for three plus years now um, in school. They are on laptops as much as I am at home when I work from home. Um, they have more screen time than I do some days. Uh, but they are actually being trained very easily, very early at this point, because um, I have a six year old in our house who also is on screen time at school on how to utilize these machines, how to properly regulate like what they're putting out there um, to a degree to a degree um, but um, I'm just gonna I just wanted to state that like they are they are in the middle of mm-hmm. doing that in schools right now so we they are getting the training to do some of this stuff they have a cyber class where they have to talk about you know what content is and how to find good content and stuff I have a lot more to say on that but I just wanted to throw that out there that's good to yeah, know it's good to know and again, that's one of those things that depends on the school system you're in. Right. Depends yeah. on where you're at. Yeah. Like in Texas, I'm pretty sure that we don't have any of that because our governor would probably say that's communism or something. Who knows? Um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so simplistic solutions lead to worse problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and is, is that kind of the universe that we're looking at right now of, oh, we have our politicians have these simplistic solutions to a complex problem that's going to make things worse. Is there any place that is looking at this in a nuanced way to say, 
okay, let's actually study this and spend some time and get it right. I don't, I don't know of any pending bills or legislatures that are doing a more sophisticated analysis. Um, I certainly don't know of any in the U.S. I don't know if you know of any internationally. Yeah. Um, I, I know that the EU has been looking at that again. Sure. But I haven't looked at the stuff in detail. I know it's just sort of floating back to the top again. Yeah. So I know the French Data Protection Agency has some stuff that they've been they've been putting out, but I, yeah, I'm not that sure. So but there are laws. I think there are lawsuits. Um, Haley and I were discussing one recently that the Arkansas version of this law recently got struck down. Yeah. Um, not struck down. It got challenged. Challenged, yeah. and the judge said it is likely to the challenge is likely to succeed with this law being unconstitutional. Yeah. And Utah is also, if it hasn't been, I think likely to be challenged. So we're mm -hmm. seeing lawsuits also come out. Right. So and I think the lawsuits will challenge the law. Like you, if the laws get knocked down, then you have to go back and you have to think harder. Right. Um, and there, it's part of the legislative process to be like, we'll put one thing in. It will get knocked down. We'll put another thing in, see what of that gets knocked down. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to go through those iterations sometimes and see all the bad before you can get to something good, but that is at least happening. Okay. So in Ready Player One, the solution was to turn off the Oasis for two days. Can we not do that? Money. Yeah. <laughs> it was facetious, but yeah. Public safety. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I run, one of the things I do is we run a little media company. We promote a lot of writers. We promote a whole lot of, you know, fandom, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, at the same time, there ha we have to understand what the fiscal incentive is going to be for the companies that are doing this. And, you know, as we're seeing, you know, platforms, you know, rise and fall. Money gets spent. Money moves. And as we're seeing money flooding flood out of some of these and into others, it's all the money. I mean, if recently there was a um, yet another mass shooting in North Carolina, and at a, a school that a colleague of mine used to teach at, and so he was like, "I need to take some time off." A lot of my friends were impacted by this, and I had a moment where I was like, "Yet again, a mass shooting that I am not aware of because mass shootings do not make national headlines anymore." because they're so commonplace. They happen all the time. Imagine being in the community where that is happening on one of your days where the government has said, we're turning off the internet. We're turning off social media. No posting for you today. Um, I, th I think that there are real, like there are human rights concerns. There are human rights campaigns all over the world um, about not allowing government or corporate actors to turn off the internet unilaterally because it typically is done to prevent protests and to shut down dissent. Um, and so it, it sounds, I think, really good. But in practice, we have like these tools have had huge, massive benefits for people to be able to get information immediately. And we're going to be taking that away. Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of end on that positive note is the benefit of social media is there. You know, the role that it played, for example, in the Arab Spring, enabling protesters to gather and to organize and to, you know, try to effectuate change is a really important thing until dictators discover that, oh, I'm going to utilize this and I'm going to co-opt this technology for my own purpose. So it has that benefit. Um, and it, it seems like we're kind of left with, it, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. You should have more education. You should have more parental involvement. And is there a case to be made for some regulation, some moderation? Yes, but it shouldn't be this either or that we're constantly being pre presented in our society. And, and here's, I, I want to talk about two problems with that. Number one is that technology largely is an either or. I can give you a, you know, I can give you the solution because again, if I give you a bunch of opt-ins but opt-outs, it creates more confusion, user issues. But also from a technological standpoint, I'm not going to invest a lot of capital to provide that, that kind of experience unless there's a material financial incentive. The second thing I want to talk about is, again, this is that education standpoint about the particular shooting you're talking about. When you go through certain kinds of training and certain kinds of events, um, there's a big problem with social media on that kind of a shooting event. Now, the one that happened in North Carolina, I happen to be, I happen to live in North Carolina. When you followed that shooting, you had a bunch of people that were live streaming, sitting there going, oh my God, I'm in this classroom and I'm terrified. 
if I have somebody that is actively going room to room, what that person just did was I just told you what targets were where, how many are there there, no one is armed, no one is defending themselves and they're terrified. You're now an easy target. I will walk in the room and eliminate you immediately. The second part of that is the opportunity though, however, if I take my device, I turn on the camera and the feed and I put it in the hallway or somewhere that I can monitor and watch, somebody else can link to me. I can see if somebody's coming. Law enforcement can watch that. HRT can respond to that and see if we make educated, informed, and intentional decisions in moments of crisis. And if we look at things like the Arab Spring, one of the big, th there's a project I cannot talk about unless you find me in the bar. Um, but the way governments look at this data, again, we have to remember, if you're putting it on social media, it is not private. You have zero expectation of privacy. I don't care what anybody tells you. The things that can be used to trigger, manage, and motivate an arrow spring can also be used for me to trigger, manage, follow what your behaviors are until I decide to come pick you up. Having spent a lot of time, not only in the U.S., not only in Europe, I've been in Cuba. I have been in a lot of countries and seen how these countries operate. And so if I happen to decide I've been dissenting about China and I'm just going to go on a tourist trip to China, you may be picked up. So it's knock-on effects not only because of what you do where you live, but because of where you may think you want to go and travel. Jim Nettles, Bluebird of Happiness. <laughs> I'm here to be cheerful. But so, at the same time, it's how we use these things with intent and we understand the implications. Right, and I think that applies. I mean, all of the, all of the things that you've just said doesn't only apply to children. We should be thinking about how to make the Internet a better place for all of us. Absolutely. On that note, I want to throw it open. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand, come up to the microphone, and we'll get to you. Okay, <clears throat> so a lot of the discussion was about how to legitimize identification with social media. Do you think we are past the point of anonymity on the internet being more damaging than good? Or in the case of the real world, we have agencies that handle our identification with the physical world. You know, I like driver's licenses, social security cards, passports, like we mentioned. Do you think it would be beneficial for there to be something in that vein with having access to the internet that you can then have people with accountable identification? No. Then you also take no. the identification away from the social media responsibility and you put it onto the responsibility of the internet as a whole and it's harder to get around it and spoof it, essentially. So you're talking about something like a, like a digital, national digital ID? I, I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I have a lot of issues with that. <laughs> Do you think there would ever be a time where that is beneficial? There are times it is beneficial. Yeah. Where it is beneficial is in controlling bad actors and in your legitimizing your interactions with companies and businesses. It would help cut down on fraud and Ill illegitimate purchases, things like that. Um, but to because I've worked on those projects where we've looked at how do you create identity with some of these kinds of agencies. Um, however, I think that the greater problems, because again, I am very much a free speech advocate. Um, there are times anonymity is required. As a writer, I, ha I write under a bunch of names. Some of those are well known and well connected. Some of those are not. Very much by intent, because if it were publicly known that I write about certain things, certain ways, in certain spaces, and they connect that to, you know, to identities. For example, I can publicly talk about the fact I write about murder mysteries about gnomes, right? It's smart ass, it's fun stuff. At the same time, if I'm going to go run a $50 million project in certain secured environments, they might not necessarily like that. It's less of a problem now, but there are times that I, you know, I write about having certain kinds of knowledge and experience and projects and things that I've done, that would potentially create conflict when I go write certain things about free speech and privacy and these sorts of things, the two would be in conflict. Okay. And I would say, you know, put even more sharply. So before I was at EFF, I was a reporter for the Washington Post, uh, like a very public um, figure with public name, unusual name, right? I'm the only, as far as I know, I'm the only Haley Tsukayama who shows up on Google. Um, 
I got a lot of threats. A lot of women, particularly women in media, particularly women of color in media, get a lot of threats um, when you post things online. I have a lot of accounts that I don't associate with my name or I associate with a different name. Um, and I don't want people to be able to find me. I don't want anybody to be able to tie those things together. If there are people that are making those threats to you, though, and you have this type of identification system, wouldn't they be able to be held accountable? I mean, if somebody was willing to prosecute them, which is often not the case. Okay. <laughs> There's also the government aspect of this. I think we like to think there, I mean, Jim started with the thing it would be good for is control. And then he went on and said a bunch of other things. And I would have probably stopped the sentence there. Um, it's good for control. And every government controls segments of their population. There are segments of the population that are more under threat of government surveillance um, and control operations than other segments. Um, it was not far in the past in the U.S. that the FBI was sending letters to Martin Luther King Jr. telling him he should kill himself um, and putting him under extreme amounts of surveillance because he was a civil rights activist who they saw as a threat to the system of government as it was. Um, today, it's a lot of um, Black Lives Matter, of PETA and um, animal rights protesters are under a large amount of surveillance, environmental protesters under large amounts of surveillance, um, indigenous communities that are protesting oil lines are under large amounts of surveillance. These are the people who need anonymity and that they're organizing and their political actions to make sure that they are trying to protect themselves and their families from government intervention. And I think outside of the US, it is at least as bad, if not worse, depending on what country you're looking at. Um, and so there are, um, Haley talked about the, the immediate physical threat from other actors. There's the wanting to be anonymous vis-a-vis -vis companies just because you don't want your this company to know exactly who you are and why you're buying things. Um, and then I think there is vis-a-vis -vis the government and making sure that you have some realm of freedom from the government. Um, and honestly, there was a great article in Wired a while ago um, about the, um, oh God, what agency was it? The IRS tracking criminals who were using and trafficking in cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. um, which you think like they, you use the most anonymous produce it, like technologies to try to, and these are criminals who are purposely trying to cr shadow their steps to make themselves untrackable everything is trackable. Like if you have a, the ability to go get a warrant and can track transactions back, you can identify people. Like nobody is ever truly anonymous on the internet. What anonymity does in the protection of anonymity is protecting the masses and protecting people who might need um, even that certain level to be able to engage in their activities. Um, but with enough information and certain government, well-funded government agencies have that information, anybody is able to be de-identified. I recently had a GPS tracker in my car um, that I had no idea who put it in and they were able to go back and find the identity of that person. It's Anonymity is necessary, but it's also a little bit of a scam um, once you get enough data. So, Short you, answer, no. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Let's try to get another one or two in. Uh, the gentleman Come back to the there, mic. please. Okay, uh, I also wanted to actually just add on to the point of like anonymity not being a thing or governments like tracking people. This, it's not just tracking. I mean, in Atlanta last year, the uh, people who organized a bail fund uh, during COVID and started it were like arrested <laughs> uh, because they were running a bail fund. Um, and they got released later, but it was like, you know, they were able to arrest them. The donations to the bail fund immediately plummeted. <laughs> they did that because they can identify them. And also just, yeah, anyone can be identified. Mm -hmm. And it's more, if there's a national registry, it's just way easier to point the lens by, like, metadata. Just, like, give mm -hmm. me all queer activists mm -hmm. in Atlanta that may, you know, help DeSantis not like <laughs> win this help DeSantis win the state or like not win the state like okay let's let's My get them in Florida so you're you're directly talking to me here. yeah <laughs> you know like let's and without that you have to 
even the government has to try a lot harder. And mm. with a certain amount of information, it actually becomes much harder because it's not all tagged in the same way. Well, I just want that's less true now than it was. Yeah, <laughs> Meta, we now have technical capabilities, and part of the part of the power of some of the new. And they're really not that new, but some of the things that we see with AI and with the ability to crunch data, I can connect people through lots of disparate ideas, but we, because we, how we pool data, how we manage large amounts of metadata, you can, you can actively target and drive down to people very quickly just based on things that you think are innocuous behavior. Yes, I know I sound like I'm the prophet of doom and gloom. Everyone You're needs welcome. A, everyone needs a disappointment, Panther. Huh. So. Um, Hard however, parcel with this work. At the same, here's the other thing I will add as the, the high note. Part of the way that you remain anonymous is by not, is by taking behaviors and acting in ways that make you blend into the herd. It's when we make those decisions to stand up and say, I'm going to get my hand whacked, which I have, um... It's when we make those decisions to sit up on a public stage like this and have these conversations. There's tremendous value. The point of all of me pointing out the risks, the challenges, the, the questions, putting trackers on vehicles, threats that come, is when you stand up, you're going to receive threats. You're going to receive things. So you have to be ready and intentional to take those things and go tell people to go F off and tell them come on and be ready to do that and handle the consequences of the actions and accept that what you're working towards is a greater good that you're trying to accomplish and you're just going to have to deal with the bad actors because it's the cost of doing business. Thank you Thank for your you. time. I think we have time for one more. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so I really wanted to just point the, uh, throw this out there. Um, as someone who has teenage girls, um, uh, one of the things I'm really struggling with is um, we don't have any social media. My kids are not allowed to have anything. They aren't even allowed to use the internet because I had the issue of my 14-year-old sexting and video chatting with strangers online at 13. And um, it has affected her mental health extremely. So we have cut off all internet in our home. We only have streaming services and the switch. And even that, we don't have any chat, anything. And um, so I've had to really deal with the, the very negative side of social media and active options for my kids. And um, one of the things I find is that there are more people out there that will claim to be 13 than anything else. Um, and that's so, for me, social media or any other, anything that has an age range or age restriction, that sexual aspect of someone's gonna always claim to be younger than they are as well. Not just the old kids trying to be older, the reverse is also really, really true. Um, so how would you regulate something like that? Because, yeah, you can claim to be 14 all day long, even if you're a 40-year-old man. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets back to whatever the technology is for age verification and whether it's trustworthy and so forth, but it's an enormous problem. I mean, predators, what you're talking about, do that all the time. Yeah, of course, I'm a, I'm a young girl of, you know, 15 or whatever. Um, and. How do you balance those two without doing like you, cutting off the internet and saying no more versus regulating everything and going nuclear? Um, that's, that's the difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're out of time. If anyone has a real short response to that. I mean, I, there's so many different aspects to this. The one thing we never hit on is the fact that technology geared at controlling for parents controlling children is actually generally geared toward abusive partners controlling their partners um, and reutilize in those ways and so like this has been a long conversation yet we have only scratched the surface of yeah. a lot yeah. of these issues so many well, this is another big thing yeah. Yeah. thank you very much all of you for attending and for the questions um, please make sure to rate the panel in the app and um, have a good con thanks again for coming out have a good day thank you